Hello everyone, in today's video I'm going to be counting down, or counting up, or however you prefer, the top 10 things I would like to see in Microsoft Flight Simulator 2024. Now one thing I will say right away is this is not necessarily a comprehensive list. Uh, these are just things that I prioritize when it comes to flight sims. Some people are probably going to have a different opinion as to what the priorities should be, but these are just kind of the general ideas that I think of. And this is also in response to a request where somebody said, well, would you like to see in the 2024 edition? So let's go ahead and get started. Number one, loading times. Now I know the flight simulator is a very, very, very large, very, very complicated simulator. But when it comes to loading, this is ridiculous. This is a, not a 1998 Windows 95 computer with spyware on a traditional hard disk drive. This is a very, very powerful, very, very capable computer. And man, can it take some time in order to get this thing booted up. I know there are people out there who have tons and tons of scenery packs. I do have a few airplanes, but this is just ridiculous. I cannot get over it. Even if I delete every single thing out of my community, every single add-on, this still takes minutes on a very, very heavy-duty up-to-date computer. Uh, the new version of Flight Sim should have a better way that this works. I don't know if it means uh, kind of post-loading things or only loading things as you need. You know, don't scan the airplane data until we actually need the airplane. I don't know what it's going to be, but this would definitely be one of the first things that I'd like to see improved in the 2024 version of Microsoft Flight Sim. Number two, and uh, this one is a personal pet peeve of mine, and that is control linearity. Uh, one of the things that uh, Flight Sim does is they intentionally change the response of your actual controls based on what speed you're traveling at. If you actually were to take a look down below here, if I pull my throttle all the way to zero and all the way up, you can see it gets me a nice even one-to-one -one motion. Now watch what happens when I move my stick. You see it? That is one of the most frustrating things for me as a real-world pilot. Because in the real world, if I want to snap my control hard to the left, like I'm dealing with a really, really aggressive type of turbulence or a very, very touchy landing, I like to be able to do that. I knew that this was done for the purposes of making it very butter smooth. I mean, look at the controller. I'm moving it that much, and that's how much response I'm getting. But when I'm in an aircraft that is a little bit more touchy, especially if you're moving slow with a general aviation airplane, I need to not have something decide for me what my control should be doing. It should respond in a way that makes sense. Now, one of the things that, that makes me absolutely crazy, and I know there are ways you can go into your settings and actually adjust linearity. I also picked this aircraft intentionally because I knew that that effect was very, very aggressive. But the reason that I just mentioned this is if you're flying something like even like the basic 172, you'll notice that when you push the throttle forward as fast as you can, it goes, that's a technical term for moving slowly, by the way. And unfortunately, that's killer. In the real plane, if I need to push that throttle forward, I need it now. And many of those aircraft actually have special booster pumps that help you out. Corollary to the issues with the controls is when they do this, you'll notice that you get this weird little touchiness that exists. Do you see that slight delay in the movement of the controller that's causing it to be very, very touchy like this? That's another thing that needs to be adjusted and it needs to be something that is adjusted by plane. It is so frustrating. Uh, some of the competitors for a Microsoft Flight Sim, such as DCS or X-Plane, do a fantastic job of simulating the way that the controls operate in a way that feels natural to a pilot who flies aircraft normally. So this is one of those things that they really, really need to change. It makes me crazy. Number three, in-game flight failures, or in-flight in-game failures. Now, one of the issues that I have as a real pilot is the things I like to do is I like to simulate different types of systems failures. Now, what they've done is they made a pretty nice job of giving us a general spread of different failures that could happen to the aircraft. Now, for those of you who are familiar with some of the other flight simulators out there, like again, such as DCS or X-Plane, you have massive pages of failures down to individual instruments. Now, as a person working on an IFR certification myself, these things are really important to me, and I have to get very creative to simulate a dead attitude indicator, for example, rather than a simulated vacuum system. Some of the other flight sims do a great job. And another thing that flight sim does not do well here is the fact that these are all basically engine related. There's other parts of an aircraft that can fail. And the fact is that I can't turn these failures on and off inside of the simulator itself. I have to get them all set up here and then start my mission in order to actually go use them. This is just one of those little things where like, if you want the full experience, you really need the ability to try these things rather than going back and forth and dealing with the long loading times and having to kind of play with those. And even re-enabling and disabling them in the simulator would be awesome because then you could actually try the same thing five or six times in a row until you build up that good skill to deal with it directly. Number four, 
the mission editor. Now, there's one thing that is really, really cool here in Flight Sim, and that's the different types of activities that you have access to. Setting these activities, unfortunately, are actually relatively challenging to actually do. And you know, one of the things you probably know is when you're in the world map, um, for example, I want to create myself a quick flight. I want to say, I want to start right here. And uh, let's say this one, let's say I want to fly an approach into New Haven, which happens to be here. You'll notice that I have no control over anything like my altitude here. It says 1,500 feet. What if I don't want 1,500 feet? What if I want 15,000 feet in the simulated spiral? Uh, you know, when I come in here and I want to go, oh, let me load up a particular page. And I got to open up these different pages and go back here. And then the flight conditions, oh, this is all done really, really well. And it's very, very easy. But things as strong as, hey, I just want to come in here and adjust my initial altitude to X, Y, and Z, it won't allow you to do that. Now, the other thing you probably noticed in several of the 2024 videos for the new flight simulator coming out is the fact there are like helicopter missions, there's loading missions, there's rescue missions. That's fantastic. And I can't wait for those things to come out. But for me, the more important thing is to be able to quickly and easily create those items. If, for example, I want to do a VIP delivery from, you know, downtown Manhattan or something like that, and I want to make it go all the way down across and kind of enjoy a nice flight like that, or I want to do a rescue of uh, somebody over here in Long Island Sound who maybe their ship went topsy-turvy, I want to be able to just right-click, add mission, go. I would prefer it if it was like that, as opposed to having to have people sit there and carefully, cautiously build each one of those little pieces, even if it's at a cost of the depth. Uh, one of the great things is if you look over at the DCS, for example, and they do an excellent job with their mission editor, allowing you to customize every little thing, and you can go as light or as hard on those missions as you want without a lot of extra work. But again, providing that awesome level of flexibility. Number five, performance of virtual cockpits. Now, one thing I want to say in full disclosure here is many of the aircraft that have uh, that came with flight sim, like your TBM 930, even with really sophisticated avionics, the performance is fantastic. But a lot of third-party aircraft, for whatever reason, and again, I just picked this one up completely at random here, have really, really poor performance issues in their virtual cockpits. You know, when I'm looking out my window like this, you know, it's, it's got a little bit of the chunk here. You can see it very distinctly. Again, I have a very powerful computer. But the moment I start turning my head and look in this direction, my frame rate halves itself. And now I know it's worse on the ground than it is in the air, but one of the reasons, there has to be some reason why many, many different aircraft that have it, even if they're not glass cockpits, suffer badly with performance when they're inside of a situation when you're in the cockpit itself versus when you're outside of the cockpit. I don't know if the emphasis there was on VFR flying from the tail in third person or just enjoying it. There has to be some kind of level of detail. There has to be some kind of internal option. There must be some way to improve the performance. Uh, for those of you who like to do VR like myself, Aircraft like this, for example, or the AN-225, are completely inaccessible because you just cannot fly them. Aircraft on the flip side, like the 172, fabulous performance. You know, for 90 frames per second, no issues at all, even if it's the G-1000 with synthetic terrain visible. And I know there's some systems complexity in some of the other aircraft, but this a little issue with the virtual cockpits not having good performance extends to some aircraft that were even 1920s, 1910s, with six or seven instruments on board that is still an issue. Now, that is something that absolutely has to be addressed. That's one of those things that makes me crazy and keeps me away from doing certain things that I really enjoy in the sim. Number six, air traffic control. Now, the air traffic control built into Microsoft Flight Simulator is actually pretty good. Uh, one of the things that I appreciate about it is it kind of hits all the highlights. If you have automatic air traffic control on, it really does a nice job of kind of checking all the little boxes that needs to be done. But there are a couple things that air traffic control could be modified to kind of bring it to the next level. The first one for me would be the ability to use your voice in order to control the air traffic control. Now you're immediately going to scream at the monitor going, wait a minute, there's third party applications for that. Yeah, but why is that not something that's just built in? Uh, the reason that I say that is a huge piece of flying for me in the real world is that communication. I am always on the radio. It's not necessarily that I'm constantly talking out loud on the radio. It's just that I'm always listening to it. I'm always aware of it. I always have to make my communications with it. And a huge part of me as a pilot in command, one of the things that I feel that flight training only partially taught me how to do was to be able to communicate with those good folks down on the ground who are keeping an eye out for the nice, safe flow of traffic. And without having to use your voice and without having to be able to kind of call all those different components, it makes it a little less authentic. Now, one of the things that I love is, you know, I can just come up here. If I want to press nearest airport list, I can press that button. Um, I can see that I'm uh, kind of cruising along uh, pretty safely here. One thing I do not see is my destination airport, where I'm flying into Hartford at this particular point. So if I have to come in here, I have to press airports farther from me. I have to click on Hartford Brainerd. I have to get the correct frequency and dial that all in myself. Ideally, what I would do is exactly what I do in the real plane. 
I would come down here, I get 119.6, which is what Bradley would hand us off to if we're getting flight following. I do myself a quick little flip right here. Uh, Brainerd Tower, Optica 64 is uh, nine miles to the northeast. I'm looking for full stop with information, Charlie. You know, that's exactly what I would normally do. Even though I'm a pretty good distance away from the airport, they'd say, you know, Optica 64, you know, make a right traffic for runway two Brainerd. They'd be like, right uh, traffic runway two Brainerd, Optica 64. And that's exactly what I would do in a normal flying situation. And it's very natural and getting over that is challenging. Now, some of you are immediately going to scream, well, wait a minute. Um, what about, uh, you know, the VATSIM? Isn't that work? VATSIM is amazing. The things that people do on that are incredible folks. The challenge with VATSIM is, is that it isn't a universal item. And often you also have to deal with the concept of the top-down delivery of airspace. You also, of course, have to count on things being available in the area that you want to operate it. When it's working at its best and everybody's staffed, it is amazing. But for everyone else in all these other situations, or for the folks like myself who get kind of shy, you would prefer to actually go ahead. I actually have to call for the request here. You would prefer so that you could kind of warm yourself up to it before diving right in. Now, leaving the initial kind of buttons like you have here is perfectly fine as well as for those folks who do not want to use their voice to call it. But having that little aspect really, really, really will bring you closer in line with like my day-to-day -day flying sort of experience. With that as well with air traffic control is we're very limited on what we can ask for. So in this case, uh, you can see I can get a transition. Um, I would not say request class D, I'd say requesting transition. Um, you could get a touch and go or a full stop. Uh, one of the things that I would do in the real world, especially if um, we're not sure like of what's going on in the weather that day, is I could request the option. I could say I request the option. So one of the things they would do, of course, is they'd either approve me for the option, um, touch and go or stop, by the way, in case you're curious about that one, and they would give it to me. And unfortunately, uh, what will happen sometimes is they'll give you all sorts of really, really fun, little complicated stuff. Now, I typically fly without other air traffic only on account of the fact that it reduces, you know, the CPU load when I'm recording videos and things like that. But in the real world, if you're at a training airport like this one right here, it is not uncommon to absolutely get leveled in the traffic pattern by eight or nine airplanes at a time. Tower. Also, the guy at Brainerd Tower has a really, really fun accent, and it's awesome. Straight in for 2-0. Straight in 2-0, Optica 6-4. But you can see how fluid that is. You can see how natural that is. But I push the button, and it's cleared to land 2-0, red 6-4. I mean, ah! It's just it's one of those things that really makes a huge difference. Number seven, alternate navigational systems. Now, one of the coolest things that this version of Flight Sim has offered us that we have not had in previous versions of Microsoft Flight Sim is the fact that we have access to some really, really classical aircraft, you know, airplanes uh, such as uh, this lovely DC-3 here that we're flying off at night. Uh, we have access to planes from the 1910s, 20s, 30s, almost every generation. You know, we've even got a Wright Flyer. But one of the things that I really, really miss, and uh, these are things that are existing, that's interesting to look at, uh, things that exist in some other mods or in some uh, existing versions are the other techniques, such as using astral navigation. Uh, you know, this would be a very typical thing. We'd look up at the stars, we'd look through our little sextant here, and we'd identify the position of a star, we'd measure the star and have that all calculated, work it out and be able to identify our exact position. Well, <laughs> Exact is a relative term with astral navigation. Uh, there are other items such as Loran, uh, which is an old school technique where basically you could measure the pulse between two different uh, Loran signals to identify actually very, very, very accurately actually where you are over the ground at any given point. You had other systems such as Oboe, uh, you had flying the beam, uh, you had all sorts of different crazy ways in order to actually navigate the aircraft uh, as precisely as you could back in those old days. You ever look up the systems they used prior to ILS? And you'll see that there are actually some really wild methods for getting the aircraft safely down under the ground that we didn't typically see. And unfortunately, without that aspect in here, I mean, as great as it is that we have all these nice modern systems, we're missing a whole aspect of flying that we really never get to experience normally, unless, of course, you know, we have sophisticated mods or, you know, we can go run in our backyard with a sexting kind of thing. This is more of a wish list item for me because I just love that old school technology and having to actually work for your getting your position. But again, it's so neat to see how that has evolved and how it makes aircraft of that era so different. Number eight, multiplayer options. Now, one of the coolest things that Flight Sim added here was the ability to actually be able to fly around as if like an MMO kind of a thing where there's all sorts of different players existing all around the same time. Now, the thing I love this, if they set it to live, we get to experience. If you had all players, 
You literally get everyone kind of a thing like that. Now, one of the things that makes this sort of challenging is in existing versions of Flight Sim, you could create yourself your own dedicated server that you could utilize for the purposes of keeping things, you know, kind of contained. And in those existing rooms, you had some neat opportunities where, you know, you could basically join up with a bunch of friends. Now, what had happened is you get things like you know, IVAO and the VATSIM folks, and you got a fly virtual of Boston like we have up here. And they would basically allow you to have a much, much larger environment of folks that you'd be operating with and with any given type of flying. So one of the cool things that they also added is the ability to set your flights in groups as group only. Now, this poor shop right here has no idea that I'm here. Now, if he had all players enabled, he just watched an F-18 I go ripping across. <laughs> so you can just imagine how much nicer it would be if you could somehow fix the kind of requirements for people who would appear around you. Imagine, for example, you could put a setting on that that does general aviation only. Imagine you have a button that uh, disables anybody who has a jet. Imagine if there's a button that you could limit it to, you know, certain sort of regions around you to really, really customize the kinds of traffic that you want to be flying around with at any given moment. All those advantages would make multiplayer, as awesome as this is, slightly more friendly for folks who are looking to do, you know, large group flights without having to do dedicated servers or without having to uh, fits around with a lot of the different settings that you have. Yeah, 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 I'm Red 6-4, get to it, kind of a thing like that. Boston Tower, Red. Number nine, shared cockpits. Now, there is a really, really neat mod out there that enables you to actually share a cockpit with another person. It's a super, super cool thing. I've done videos about it on the past for those of you who like to check it out a little later on. It's something that I've had a pretty good amount of success with. Uh, this particular tool for doing the shared cockpits, it generally works. It enables you to basically link up to anybody that you have the IP address of. It also, of course, will enable you to, you know, share all sorts of different aircraft. But unfortunately, because of the way the aircraft does share variables in this particular version of Flight Sim, there are just so many, many, many things that make it very, very complicated in order to make it work well. There's already a really solid multiplayer code built into this version of Flight Sim, and it would be very impressive if they could expand upon that to basically enable us to easily share cockpits like back what we used to do in Flight Simulator X. Another reason I really like the shared cockpits is if I'm flying with a second person, like a navigator, for example, I have them. I, you know, I used to fly jets works where I could do co-pilot, you know, regular pilot. You could define exactly who has the access to what buttons, you know, who's my flap guy, who's my light guy, am I the guy with the controls? And all that would synchronize itself in a smooth and very, very transparent kind of a fashion. Now, those were the most fun times ever, because if you went over to places like VATSIM, for example, having that extra crew member added a whole other level of awesome to all the flying that you got to do. And it really, really took things into, like, I'm not going to call it a realistic level, but it brought it kind of to that next level that makes things a little bit better to actually experience. Again, trying to attract more people into the actual hobby itself. Now, that could be set up as simple as clicking on your plane and saying, let anyone chop in. Imagine a bunch of randos climbing into your Cessna 172. <laughs> that could be kind of fun. Of course, you could also have a situation where you could say friends only. You could uh, set it so that your aircraft, you can invite somebody to an aircraft that you're flying. All those things could be integrated in into it to make it a very, very, very simple process for those of you who like to be able to have that experience of having two people fly. Now, one of the things that many of people have said is it's very, very challenging to you know, learn to operate these aircraft. And how much better would it be if somebody could just climb in there with you and be able to very, very simply, very, very straightforward, walk you through it and experience a whole new level of awesome that is inside Flight Sim. Number 10. Uh, this is going to be one that you probably saw coming, maybe not. And that is going to be to expand kind of the career side of Flight Sim. You know, um, I'm not a huge fan of the concept of having like a progression where you have to get 16 hours in order to fly a Cessna 172 instead of a Cessna 152. Oh, by the way, you have to be really, really careful because if you fly with a damage turned off, it does not track your hours. I have three times as many hours in Steam in this game. But one of the things that I would really, really be impressed with is, you know, if this were expanded more. You know, things like where you, if you remember I was talking a little bit earlier about generating missions, you know, if you want to do the helicopter pilot career, you know, you could keep track of all these different items that they have in here that are actually built into it. That <laughs> Distance without stall, really? But it gives you the ability to go ahead and control these things and actually, you know, beyond just achievements, but actually, you know, have like, you know, you've earned $16 from flying a VIP from Newark, New Jersey up to, you know, FRG or like carrying a cargo freight in the middle of the night or like any of those kind of items would be really, really impressive that if they built that into here. Like I said, no need for progression. And the other thing I would say that's very, very critical to all of that is making sure all that material is going to be something that is optional. It is not required. And yes, you're yelling at me again saying, these are things you can get in third party. 
but they shouldn't have to be. And that's kind of my important point that I'd like to kind of say that really, really does make a difference inside of these. You know, how much fun would it be? Like, I'm not saying you need to get the unlock the gold version of the Cessna 172. I'm not saying that in the slightest. I'm just saying it'd be really cool for those of you who, for example, play the games like Simcopter uh, to actually, you know, be able to go through and, you know, have random missions pop up and you take the random missions and, you know, tracks your progress and you're paying for gas and everything like that. Just to add a whole new level to this game that would be absolutely wild to experience, as well as, you know, attract a different kind of player into the game itself. And that is my none too exhaustive list of things that I would like changed in the 2024 version. There are a bunch of other things that uh, did not make the list, though, which are things that I would love to see. And I know I mentioned many times there are some third party pieces, but for those of you who start messing with the third party route, you realize how frustrating it would be if it was just integrated and had something nice open ended like a little Lua script that you could download, like you see in a lot of popular modifications in other games. There's one thing I will leave with, though, and uh, this is just. This is more of a nitpick, but um, I can't tell you how much this makes me crazy, but the stall performance of these aircraft is very, very fabricated. So like normally when an aircraft stalls, that's what it does. You know, the nose drops on you, and if you were to pull back aggressively with it, it would just get a little bit worse. But uh, one of the things that many of the aircraft have is a very, very strong spin tendency. You know, while aircraft do spin, believe it or not, they don't do that. <laughs> That would only be if you really, really, really had an uncoordinated, overpowered stall. As a matter of fact, a lot of aircraft like this, um, what you can do is you can actually tap the gas, and you can do a falling leaf with it, where basically you'd hold the nose up just high enough, uh, like that, and you'd basically falling leaf to the ground, but in this game, it just noses over worse, and uh, that's kind of the, kind of be the end of your flight, unless you could safely brrr, give it a burst of power and fly out of it. It's a little thing, but many aircraft that I found, like for example, the fighters, they just drop a wing and they just wouldn't do that unless they were in a situation where the actual aircraft itself is completely unbalanced, incredibly uncoordinated. Aircraft are generally pretty safe to fly. Uh, they certainly can stall and they will stall if you're rough with them, but they're not necessarily going to suddenly dumping on you that hard. I know that's a bonus number 11, but it's just one of those little things that makes me crazy kind of a thing, especially because you know in a real world, we practice stalls all the time, and yeah, you know, I've gotten pretty used to them, but I've never experienced aircraft uh, as a whole. Again, some of them are absolutely fantastic individually that struggle that much with, whoa, we've got to go into spin because spins are cool. Just kind of one of those things. But other than that, uh, that's my list of 10 things I'd love to see changed, added, removed, updated for 2024. And as always, enjoy.